Hmm. Hola. Hola. <laughs> Thank you.
Good afternoon. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties, but I guess at this point, uh, we can already start. Uh, I'm JC Punong Bayan, Assistant Professor here at the University of the Philippines School of Economics. Uh, and welcome to our guests uh, who are uh, visiting uh, maybe for the first time. So uh, this room is uh, newly refurbished, uh, and I think this is one of the first uh, events to be held here after the renovation. So <laughs> extra special afternoon uh, today. So uh, I'll be moderating this uh, afternoon's uh, event, and uh, we're very privileged to have with us this afternoon uh, a renowned economist and uh, impact evaluation expert, uh, Noam Angrist, uh, to talk about their uh, groundbreaking study. Uh, basically, it's an impact evaluation study, randomized controlled trials uh, conducted in five countries, including the Philippines. So uh, it's a massive study, and there's a lot to be unpacked here. So uh, we're very lucky to have Noam with us to uh, unpack all of that. So. Um, uh, maybe we can uh, jump right into it uh, uh, while we're fixing the technical difficulties. So uh, first, uh, let me introduce our speaker. And by the way, we have esteemed guests as well who will uh, serve as discussants after uh, Noam gives his talk. So uh, to introduce our speaker, Noam Angris is co-founder of Youth Impact Org, one of the largest NGOs dedicated to scaling of health and education programs backed by randomized trial evidence. In addition to scaling proven programs with governments, Youth Impact Org uh, conducts regular rapid A-B tests to optimize cost-effectiveness of programs on the path to scale. Mo is also the academic director of the Mark Works Hub for Global Education at the University of Oxford uh, and has published in leading journals including Nature, Human Behavior, and the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Uh, Noam has consulted for the World Bank Chief Economist and co-developed the World Bank Human Capital Index Education Pillar. The academic research underpinning a series of studies of the global education evidence advice panel, providing recommendations on cost-effective approaches to improve learning outcomes in low- and middle-income countries. Noam was a Fulbright and Rhodes Scholar and has a BS in Mathematics and Economics from the MIT and a PhD from the University of Oxford. So please join me in welcoming Noam Angris. No. Uh, wonderful Oop, to be here. I've heard so many great things about UP, so it's quite an honor to be here. Uh, and I'm lucky to be joined by our great team in the front row here. So if you have any heard, many of them are UP alumni, which is great. Um, so I should start, right? I should dive in. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to start to share on the study, and then I'm really uh, also honored and looking forward to uh, hearing the comments from the wonderful discussants. I was already getting some wonderful feedback uh, already in the front here. Uh, so I'm going to be presenting a paper called Building Resilient Education Systems, 
evidence from large-scale randomized trials in five countries. Uh, we have a group of co-authors who were involved in this research, including Jeff Boy, who is here in the front, who's been really uh, instrumental along with Isha, who's been part of the study since day one. Uh, and so we're, we're lucky to have them here as well. I just wanna do a quick poll before I start, just so I get a sense of who's in the room. Uh, could you raise your hand if you're a graduate student? A couple graduate students. Uh, could you raise your hand if you're an undergrad? Uh, wonderful. Okay, so that's JC's class, I think. Uh, that's great. Uh, could you raise your hand if you're not a student? Yes. Um, okay, great. And then can you raise your hand if you're from a government agency? Government people uh, from a nonprofit or NGO? Uh, and then I guess they would be faculty, right? That's the other uh, category, faculty. Okay, wonderful. I just wanted to get a sense of who's in the room, and uh, it's very multifaceted. So I have a mix. I think I, I'm able to target it. I have some regression tables, uh, some figures, uh, some text. So hopefully it's a nice, healthy mix. So I'm just going to start studying education and emergencies. Uh, part of this paper and study is we're trying to make the case to researchers around the world that this is a really important topic. And I've come to understand, but I would love this audience's view, um, that here it's perhaps appreciated more than other places how big an issue it is, perhaps because there is frequent typhoon. But in many uh, parts of the world and in many research circles, this is really an understudied topic. There's not much research in this area. So one thing that we started to do when we started this paper, we actually collected some data across about 20, 30 countries over the last 20 years. This is new data. And we tried to quantify how frequent and how big are disruptions to school. So these circles are an index of how long school was disrupted and how many people were affected. And essentially what you can see here is there's a lot of disruption. School is disrupted for many, many reasons. Uh, and then we include the reasons, sometimes air pollution, earthquakes, water shortages, floods, swine flu, foot and mouth, monsoon, typhoon, you name it. So we're trying to make the case that this is a really big issue. So this is one of the first figures in our paper, and it's some new data that we included in our paper to, to make this point. Okay, I don't know, it's not clicking, maybe I'm not pointing. Okay, um, so uh, other data shows that over 2 billion people live in countries affected by disruption. Uh, pollutions, elections, conflict, climate, again, uh, as I mentioned there's some evidence that these are really costly. Kids don't learn, they're out of school, as you might expect. The United Nations actually has a global fund called Education Cannot Wait, uh, which is dedicated to this issue. It's a, a big UN global fund and estimates 222 million children uh, are affected by, by education disruptions in any given point in time. So again, a big issue. But there's very little evidence on what to do during these disruptions, very little experimental evidence. There's some evidence showing the costs, but not solutions. Now, during COVID, oops, um, there actually was a, a burst of evidence on what to do because that was another disruption and there was some evidence on solutions. So that is promising and is relevant beyond COVID. That's also part of the case that we're making in this paper is now we're starting to understand what one can do even beyond COVID. So how do you provide education when school is disrupted? Uh, one thing we turned to in this study was mobile phones. And so what you can see here is internet access. We just heard a great story about internet access, uh, how it, it's even actually quite recent. Uh, radio access, TV access, and phone access across different income categories. So in low-income countries, uh, just 20% or below of households have access to the internet. So it's not a good way of reaching people. Uh, even in lower middle income countries, less than 40%. Even radio and TV, uh, though they're common, um, not that high access. 
Uh, I think here in the Philippines, radio access is 36% from some data that we saw, so not as high access. But mobile phones, very, very high access, 80 to 90%. So this is a great way of reaching people. It doesn't always have to be smartphones. Uh, it can be simple phones. Uh, and so we turn to mobile phones uh, to try to reach people during these disruptions. So here was the intervention, a simple SMS message once per week in basic numeracy, uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, uh, and then also 20-minute uh, phone calls. We don't often think of phoning a friend or phoning a family member as technology, but it is. And it's one of the oldest, most familiar technologies of all. 20-minute phone call to children during COVID school disruptors, uh, disruptions, uh, and it was targeted. And so that meant that children who couldn't do addition were taught addition, children who couldn't do subtraction were taught subtraction. So it was highly targeted to the child's level, uh, very customized, almost like tutoring, uh, building on other principles like teaching at the right level, uh, which I know something AHA is working on here uh, and is also backed by the evidence. So that was the intervention. Only this side clicks, um, if I'm not mistaken. Or maybe it doesn't click. It's the illusion that the clicking works, actually. I have someone helping me. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, next. I'll just say next. Let me get rid of this one. Um, so two principles behind this approach. One is reaching at the right level. Okay, you have to, if you can't reach the children, you can't make a difference. Uh, and there's, as I mentioned, growing evidence and clear evidence that phones are a way of doing that. And then this principle of teaching at the right level. This is a principle that has gotten a lot of attention in education uh, recently. Uh, there's been evidence on this over the last 15 years from various randomized studies uh, showing that this approach really works. And uh, now it sounds kind of funny. Um, who wants to teach at the wrong level? It's not usually a very popular approach, yet actually many education systems were often teaching at the wrong level. We're following a very strict curriculum. It might say the children need to know fractions or division in grade four, uh, but maybe the children can't count and we still teach the curriculum, whether the kids know that information or not. So this idea of assessing the children and teaching to their level is actually kind of a novel principle and concept, but it really works. Okay, next. So the study, we first launched the study in Botswana uh, in the early part of the COVID pandemic. Uh, schools were announced to be closed in March, and then we had three days and we collected 10,000 phone numbers throughout the country. Uh, we then launched a randomized trial with 4,500 households. It was the world's first study, uh, randomized study during COVID, during distance education. We released the results, or we launched the study in April, shortly after the March closures, and then we released the results in July. So sometimes we think uh, evidence uh, has to be slow and randomized studies have to be slow. Uh, I think we proved that it doesn't have to be slow. We did it within a few months. And then we published it in Nature Human Behavior and it got a lot of attention. And then people wanted to replicate it around the world. So we did uh, because it was this time where there was so much interest in evidence and effective approaches. And so we replicated it in Kenya, in Nepal, in India, in the Philippines, in Uganda. Uh, and I'll spend a little more time on the Philippine study, uh, but just to give you a sense of what happened around the world, 18 months, six randomized control trials. Um, so also very fast evidence generation uh, with a coalition of partners, NGOs, uh, the World Bank, IPA, uh, various partners. Next. Okay, this is the original study. I think I mentioned this. We published it in Nature Human Behavior, which was great. Um, next, it worked. It was a good thing. It actually worked. So then we replicated it. And then these are the countries around the world where we started uh, testing it. So you can see those countries that I mentioned. Uh, there's actually also been a global movement around this approach in other countries as well. Next slide. This is the coalition of partners. So Youth Impact, uh, JC mentioned, is an NGO that, that I co-founded with my co-founder, Moitepi Machang. And we were founded in order to scale up randomized trial-backed programs in health and education. Uh, we've been doing that for about 10 years. 
Uh, and one thing that we've been really working on is trying to make evidence generation a bit faster so it can really respond to real time policy problems. And when COVID struck was our moment of truth, could we really generate good evidence? And we did. We, we launched a study in the startup. Uh, and we actually have a huge presence in other countries. Uh, with IPA. Uh, and the Department of Education, which I'll talk about more very shortly. But here you can see the coalition of partners. Uh, we also had really generous funders, which was really important, uh, who uh, funded this. We raised $2 million in about a month or two, uh, which made this possible uh, to replicate this around the world. So very grateful to those partners. Next. So the studies, students were in grades roughly three to five around the world uh, in various countries. Uh, and then we had these treatment arms where we had a phone call, an SMS, as well as an SMS. Uh, and then in many countries, we had about two to three months of implementation. So eight weeks or so, 20 minutes once a week. Uh, and in two countries, Philippines and Nepal, we had a treatment arm that was just NGO delivery and a treatment arm that was government only delivery. And so here, for example, we worked with DepEd to support government DepEd teachers, which was really exciting, as well as IPA NGO supported uh, instructors. Next slide. So broad geographic spread, schooling was disrupted in all these settings. Uh, we had both a mix of NGO and government delivery and really high engagement. Over half the battle was just reaching people and we had 80 to 90% engagement. Next. I'm cutting to the chase. Here are the results. Okay, so this is the main figure. Uh, on the red, I hope you can see this, you can see the SMS uh, average effect uh, on the far your left. Uh, you can see it's slightly effective, but not huge effects, 0 0.0809 standard deviations. And then the phone call and SMS really effective, 0 0.33 standard deviations. So in education, this is really big. Half of education interventions don't work at all. And then the average effective intervention is 0.1. So this is a very big deal to see this effect. That's across all countries on average. In the green is the two countries where we had government and NGO delivery. Uh, so that's Philippines and Nepal. Uh, the government was just as active as NGO. Which is also something we don't always see. So I want to pause for a second here because this is a really big deal in terms of the So I want to pause for a second here because this is a really big deal. We were actually surprised this was so effective. It's very rare that anything works. It's very rare that once it worked one place, it'll work in another place, let alone five places. And it's very rare that it works with government. So we were very pleased, no, no offense to government. I said there were some government officials here. But, um, and uh, so this was very good news. And we were, we were a bit surprised, actually. We, were, we couldn't believe it. And so we asked ourselves, why was this so effective? We didn't think it would be so effective. So I'm going to come to that, but very good news. Okay, next slide. This is just a regression table, which shows the results by country. Uh, and I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with a regression table, so I'll just share a bit. Maybe some people are, some aren't. But essentially, this is the effect size. This is the standard error. This is the p-value. We have the country. We have the observations, um, what's happening in the control group, uh, and then some other information. One thing I want to highlight is the phone call and SMS worked everywhere. And the SMS message didn't work everywhere, actually. And so that alone was not enough. Um, SMS would have been great because it's so cheap and easy, but it didn't work in Kenya and Nepal. It worked a little bit in the Philippines uh, and it worked a bit in Uganda as well, but the phone calls really worked everywhere. So that was the thing that was kind of this sweet spot of cheap enough, but effective enough. The other thing you'll notice in the Philippines, it was quite effective, second most effective of all countries. So I'll come back to why we think this happened and why it was so effective at 0.45 standard deviations. Next. I want to show one example that's not in terms of standard deviations, uh, which is just what did the kids actually learn. So this is in Uganda. Uh, and in Uganda, what you can see here in grade four, the control group, about 17% of kids could divide when the study started. At end line in the control group, only 10% of kids could divide. That means there was learning loss. So there's been a lot of discussion about learning loss. Part of this study also quantifies learning loss. In the treatment group in grade four, 
uh, you can see that the treatment recovers all the learning loss and actually recovers far beyond the learning loss. So it doesn't only make the recovery, but actually exceed it. Uh, far beyond where things started. I know there's a lot of doom and gloom, and we just talked about this in, in our interview um, about learning loss, but this provides a little bit of hope that there, it can be recovered. Learning loss can be recovered. The other thing I want to highlight here, if you look at grade five in Uganda, and you look at the control group, 21% of kids in the control group in grade five can divide. So one thing I want to highlight here is this means that between grade four and grade five, only 4% of children learn to divide in business as usual education. 4% of children learn to divide in a whole year of school. That is not very much. And so the intervention actually does way better than a full year of school. So that's really shocking. That's kind of revealing the learning crisis and the need to recover, not just the learning loss from COVID, but actually the learning crisis before COVID. Okay, next slide. Next, next. Um, how did we measure learning outcomes? This was challenging because this was a remote setting. We measured learning outcomes over the phone. Uh, so there's a bit of work also on how to do this reliably and effectively. So we did a bunch of tests to validate the learning measurements. We actually did in-person as well as phone in some studies just to make sure it was the same. Uh, we sometimes call the exact same students just to make sure that the answer was the same answer. Uh, we randomized different problems for the same proficiency. So we did a bunch of things to validate and uh, check that the learning measurement was effective. And actually, there's a whole set of research now on phone-based assessment. Actually, some interesting conversations around how that can be a tool for deep and rapid assessment. Next slide. Okay, in the Philippines, as I'm sure everyone in the room knows, there was another disruption during this study, which was Typhoon Rai. And one thing, of course, that was that was quite um, a shock, uh, but the program kept going and kept working, actually. So this was sort of another disruption, and we actually saw some evidence of resistance in effects, um, which is good news and kind of makes the point that this could be an approach in other disruptions as well. Next slide. Uh, so in conclusion on the five country study, and then I'm just going to make a few remarks on Philippines in particular, uh, five country study evaluating a particular approach. One thing I want to highlight here is uh, in a review that we did, and I think this is actually going to come up next, um, less than 1% of impact evaluations were multi-country. And so just the idea of doing a multi-country study is quite new, and we're excited to see more work in this area going forward. We think it's important. Next. Even though these countries were quite different, the phone calls worked in almost all the settings. That suggests some level of scalability and replicability. I don't know if people have been following the replication crisis, but there's a real nervousness in research circles that evidence doesn't replicate. This provides a bit of hope. This is a hopeful study. Evidence is replicating. Next slide. It worked with the government, as I said, that is not always the case. They were thrilled that happened. That also suggests scalability and cost effectiveness. Cost is really important. We don't always measure cost. Uh, in another review, less than 15% of impact evaluation measure cost. But it's very important. If this is going to be implemented in the real world, if this is going to be implemented by governments, we need to know the cost. It's actually funny that as economists, we don't always measure cost. You would think we would care a lot about cost. Uh, but it's very important. And the cost here was very cheap. And so it, what we're seeing is the learning gains are the equivalent of about four years of high quality schooling for $100. So very cost effective. Uh, future work. We're continuing to work on this. So we're doing some additional testing uh, now in Afghanistan, actually, for girls' education, because they're at home. They're not allowed in school. So that's a very disrupted setting. So we're starting pilots in our RCT there as we speak. Uh, we're also continuing to do work here. Uh, which we're really excited about, and I'll talk about more in a second, uh, in Ethiopia, in Somalia, and then in Botswana, where this all started, we continue to do A-B testing every single school term. 
where we're always improving the program. And I'm pretty sure Danica is running an A-B test as we speak, actually, on the Botswana program, uh, where we're always improving it. And I can share what we're learning there. Next. Uh, so what have we learned? We've contributed multi-context experimental evidence uh, on education and emergencies, an area that has needed a lot of evidence. We've also, we argue, contributed to just scaling in general, how to think about effective scaling across countries with governments. And one of the reasons we think this worked so well is it wasn't brand new. So it was building on things that we know work, teaching at the right level we know can work. Tutoring, we know can work. And so it was similar principles drawing on other evidence, but in a new context. And so it wasn't brand new, it was building on best practice. Uh, next, I mentioned this is one of the few multi-country studies. We hope that there's more in the future. We're seeing some energy and enthusiasm around this. Next. Um, yes, I mentioned government and NGO. We can, oh, one thing I should say on that, there actually is a well-known study that showed that a thing that worked, a teacher contract program in Kenya uh, with an NGO when it was done by the government didn't work. And that study has gotten a lot of attention. So we think we have provided a counter example here where it, it can work with the government. Uh, and then I, I mentioned this, the last point here, um, next on this one, uh, is there has just been this larger um, learning crisis, and it's been very difficult to figure out how to improve learning cheaply and at scale. Learning outcomes almost haven't changed around the world for decades. It's actually kind of shocking. So schooling has gone up, but learning has almost not moved. Uh, and there's a bunch of evidence on that, some of which I've contributed to with the World Bank Human Capital Index. So anything that works, we're really excited about. Okay, next. And then this is just some quick slides on Philippines specifically, and someone feel free to stop me if I've, I've gone over time. Uh, so here in the Philippines, the partnership was IPA, uh, Youth Impact, and the Department of Education, which was a great collaboration. So I'll just share a couple more things here. Yeah. These are the regions and areas where the study took place in the Philippines. We could do the same thing for every country, but we thought the focus here. So you can see a pretty broad distribution, 110 schools, 3,400 students at grade three and four. Now, I mentioned that Philippines was the second most effective study of the five countries. So why was that? So there's two reasons, we think. One is that school closures were some of the longest here in the world. So it's where there was a lot of need um, of the countries actually in the world. Philippines and Uganda had the two longest closures in the world. So those are the countries where it was most effective. The other thing is we actually measured how targeted was the instruction. Did the teacher actually teach addition when the child didn't know addition? Did the teacher actually teach subtraction when the child didn't know subtraction? So we had really detailed monitoring data. And one thing to highlight this in the status quo in kind of normal education, that's the case less than 1% of the time. Instruction is rarely targeted. In the first Botswana study, which was sort of the mother study where this all started, and you might think was the best of all, actually targeted instruction was just 41%. So actually, it wasn't where instruction was most targeted. And then study after study, we got better at this. And by the time we were in the Philippines with our partners here, instruction was targeted 65% of the time. And that was second most effective. Uganda was most effective, and it was targeted 81.5% of the time. So this really enforces the, the power of targeting instruction and the fact that you can learn over time. This is actually the exact order of the studies uh, that took place. So sometimes we think, oh, it worked really well when we started in the proof of concept, but as you scale, as you replicate, it always goes down. This shows actually it can go up if you're learning, if you're trying, if you're tweaking. Um, so as long as you have that ongoing learning approach. Next. What's next? So we're now thinking about what's next for this approach. In the Philippines, this approach has been called M Education. Uh, that was the, one of the names that uh, the coalition wanted to give it, mobile education. We're thinking about this as an approach for other disruptions. So typhoons, uh, maybe last mile schools we've been hearing a lot about. I'd love to learn from this room what you think is the right application. Island schools, maybe the struggling learners. That's something we've been hearing a lot about. We've been meeting with various people. And then there's a broader set of principles that actually don't necessarily have to be done over the phone. 
and can apply maybe even in class, but could also be over the phone. So this targeting idea is something you can do in school, out of school, over the phone, in other ways. Tutoring, something that has a lot of research in high income settings, but less in other settings. How do you do that cheaply? And then just thinking a bit more smartly also about technology. Often technology programs kind of dump computers in classrooms uh, or tablets in classrooms. And the evidence on that is not very good. And so, you know, maybe people have other evidence, but I haven't seen a lot of good evidence on that. Uh, this is an interesting approach because the people already have the phones, actually. So the, the technology part is actually meeting people where they are with a technology they're already familiar with, and you're just using it to do something useful. Uh, and then we've also been in discussions in the, here uh, on different kind of national priorities and agendas with DEPED, uh, the National Learning Recovery Program, um, the Teachers Remediation Hour, which I, uh, we, we're hearing is going to be one of the tasks that's still asked for by, by the system uh, and so forth. Next. Uh, yes, this is the last slide. So looking forward to scale and continue testing. Uh, we're also in discussions in BARM, actually, about opportunities in BARM. So we're actually going to BARM tomorrow, uh, and we're meeting with the government there. Uh, so that's another opportunity. Um, so would love people's views and ideas on that. Next slide. The end. And then one more slide, actually, if I may. Um, the IPA team is hiring. Uh, and so if anyone here wants to join the team, uh, it's growing. We're looking for incredible people. Uh, again, uh, the team is here at the front. Uh, so please uh, follow up and, and join the team. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Great presentation. No, thank you so much. Um, so uh, that's exactly why I invited my students. <laughs> as well as the graduate students uh, of the school. I'm sure many will be interested to join IP and similar efforts. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, as you have seen, it's a groundbreaking study. It's a massive study and uh, there's a lot to learn from it. Uh, and actually, I had the uh, opportunity to interview Noam uh, last Monday for Rappler. So uh, we have an interview version of this so that will be coming out tomorrow, I think. So uh, watch out for that as well. And uh, by the way, if uh, for those who don't know yet, um, uh, Noam is actually the son of a Nobel laureate. So uh, he's the son of uh, Josh Angris, a renowned econometrician who won the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics in 2021. So, uh, <laughs> so Noam is very special, <laughs> extra special. Okay, so uh, if you have uh, questions, please reserve your burning questions until the end. Uh, for now, let's move on to the uh, discussions by our uh, guest speakers. Uh, and let me start with uh, Dr. Mike Alba. Uh, who until recently was the president of the Far Eastern University and is now uh, concurrently serving as the president of the FEU Public Policy Center. And I had the opportunity, opportunity to work with him uh, years back. <laughs> he is also the chairman of Edustria Incorporated, governor of the Nicanor Reyes Memorial Foundation, and president of the Foundation for Information Technology Education and Development. He is affiliated with the Philippine Association of Colleges and Universities, the Coordinating Council of Philippine Educational Associations, the Southeast and South Asia and Taiwan Universities, the Philippine Economic Society, uh, Action for Economic Reforms, and the Management Association of the Philippines. He obtained his AD in Economics from Ateneo de Manila University, his MA in Economics here at the UP School of Economics, and his PhD in Applied Economics from Stanford University. And in fact, uh, Sir Mike uh, was my professor in Advanced Microeconomics here at the school right before he joined FEU to become president. So please welcome president, as president, Dr. Mike Alba. <laughs> So I have my presentation. Um, you know, I, I commit to the cardinal sin of not, not asking about um, what the audience or what this seminar is going to look like, because I thought this is going to be like the regular UPSE seminar where only professors and grad students would uh, attend. And so my... Well, my, my, my reactions, my comments are really quite technical and, uh, and, and, and they're really 
um geared towards um uh, or are there they really a critique a, a you would say referees comments to the to the paper where they submitted to a journal okay so anyway uh forgive me if i i i strike the wrong tone so good afternoon uh thank you to the up school of economics the philippine center for education uh, for economic development and dean joy abrenica for inviting me to be a discussant in today's lecture it's always a welcome occasion to have a chance to participate in serious discussions in UPSE, which unfortunately I don't get to do often enough, having crossed over to the dark side. That is not only out of UP, but to education and administration. Uh, thank you also and congratulations to Professor Angris and his co-authors for writing such a timely and relevant paper that using not the mostly harmless econometrics of Dr. Joshua Angris, his dad, but the truly useful version, masterfully and comprehensively addresses education in emergencies, a problem that is not yet well studied, but is likely to become more important as a con concomitant effect of climate change disruptions. What is most exciting is that their study opens so many interesting avenues that need to be pursued further in both research and program implementation. Let me preface my comments with an anecdote, which is mostly, which, which is most likely apocryphal, and which I first heard from, the, from Professor Joseph Capuna. I don't know if he's here. As we all know, Paul Samuelson in his younger days was the, pardon my French pronunciation, enfant terrible of, econo of economics. Allegedly, after his oral defense of his doctoral dissertation, he was requested to step out of the room so his panel could discuss their verdict. verdict. Invited back shortly after, he was greeted by the panel chair. Congratulations, Dr. Samuelson which meant that he had successfully hurdled the exam. But the panel chair then continued, did we pass? As a discussant in today's lecture, I have much sympathy for Samuelson's panel because I guess I'm in the same situation. The paper is a great read and it shows how using an experimental design makes regressions easy and straightforward since the Gauss-Markov conditions to ensure blueness, that is the, uh, in the sense of best linear and bias estimators of OLS are, are facilitated by the experimental design to be satisfied. The thing is, I've not done academic economics for a while. So this feels like an eerie time travel episode back to grad school and taking an important oral exam. So I, I'm hoping that I don't do an epic fail. Uh, kaya kahit pasang awa lang pwede na. Professor Anquist, that meant I'd be happy with a mercy pass. Um, so I organized my comments in three parts. First, I, yeah, I, I provide a summary of the large multi-country experimental field research and its findings. Second, I raise clarificatory questions superficial in nature and quibbles really, that hopefully will enhance my and the reader's understanding of the paper. And finally, I consider some implications for research and program implementation or what we in the Philippines should do next. So here goes my summary, slide two, please. The primary question the paper addresses is, in education in emergency situations, which types of interventions improve learning across many settings. The question implies that the interventions must use widely accessible information technology with its infrastructure already set in place to be able to detour around school closures and be low cost, scalable and effective in improving learning outcomes so as to be applicable in a variety of emergency settings. Thus, the interventions included in the study were designed to have four features. Slide three, please. 
So uh, first for technology, mobile phones would be used as the delivery platform. Second for cost effectiveness, two approaches would be tried. Text messages on the material to be learned would be sent weekly as well as not just for students to, to engage learning activities, and B, one-on-one 20-minute -on -one phone call tutorials would be conducted every week for eight weeks at student-teacher ratios of 20 to 1 for full-time teachers in the program and 5 to 1 for part-time teachers. But except in India, the treatments were really A only, which I will call T1, and or or A plus B, which I will call T2. In India, the treatment applied was exclusively T2. Third, for learning effectiveness, the text messages and tutorials would be adapted to student learning levels using low cost, high frequency, light touch assessments. Fourth, for scalability in government provided education systems, Two instructors would be used, A, NGO teacher aides, and B, government teachers. Slide four. On the study de design, no less than the large-scale randomized controlled trials, the gold standard for assessing the effectiveness of treatments are conducted in five countries, namely India, Kenya, Nepal, the Philippines, and Uganda. My time allocation does not allow me to dwell at length on the results, so I'll have to breeze through them. Slide five, please. So first, table one of the, of the paper answers the primary research question. Both treatments show specific, uh, specification robust, statistically significant learning score improvements with, as may be expected, T2 having larger size effects than T1. Table two addresses the scalability concern, the treatment effects on learning outcomes of government and NGO teachers are not statistically different. Third, table three suggests that teachers who conducted phone tutorials were more likely to claim that their teaching practices improved and that they developed positive beliefs about teaching. Slide six. Table fourth, table four shows that A, size effects of T2 were largest in countries that had the longest school closures, namely the Philippines and Uganda, implying that they are more effective when learning needs were greater. B, the size effects of T2 increased with the order of project implementation, implying that there was a learning curve as the trials were conducted in more countries. And C, T1 had only had statistically significant, significant effects where learning needs were the most dire. Slide seven. Um, so table five. Yeah, table five demonstrates that the treatments, T2 in particular, were able to improve learning outcomes on specific proficiencies, such as solving division problems, place value problems, word problems fractions, and also performing basic numeracy operations. And learning outcomes improve even in content that was not delivered that, or that was not covered by the treatments. Table six verifies the validity of the assessment results. The phone and in-person assessments yielded the same results on the students' learning outcomes. The learning gains were retained as measured by a assessments, is it at two points in time with the back checks? Okay, um, so they were retained and B, uh, randomized questions targeting the same competency. Moreover, table six shows that the learning gains were due to, to the development of cognitive skills in the students and not because the treatments improved the student's grit or effort. Uh, slide eight. Table seven reports the effects of Typhoon Rai or Typhoon Odette, as it was known in this country. The typhoon caused unlearning, but T2 showed substantial learning gains over the control group that was similarly affected by the typhoon. So T2 can stem the disruptive effects of natural calamities on learning. Uh, a, table eight shows that 
uh, students and their caregivers' perceptions of the students' learning improved with their participation in the treatments. Additionally, caregivers thought that their wards' learning progressed with their participation in T2, and they are willing to pay for the treatment uh, for the treatment services. Slide nine. Table nine shows that T2 had positive spillover effects on non-cognitive skills that were not targeted by the intervention, as well as on the student's well-being. Now to my first set of quibbles, slide 10. Um, it starts with figure A3. I think readers should, would get a clearer picture of the timelines if the implementation dates provided in table A6 on trial description are incorporated in the chart. But here's what I don't get. Slide 11. There are almost 13 weeks between April 1, 2021 and June 30, 2021. But Table A6 reports that in India, the duration of implementation was eight weeks. And there are 47 weeks between August 1, uh, 2021 to June 30, 2022. But in the Philippines, the duration of implementation is reported as eight weeks. Does this mean that there were longish breaks during the implementation periods? Not that it matters, but it would be nice to know. And duration of implementation and intermittent pauses in the program may have impacts on, non on the non-estimation aspects, such as tutoring quality, learning motivation, learning momentum. Uh, the other thing that's not clear to me is if we can back up one slide. So slide, what is it? Slide 10. Um, when, when, uh, what's not clear to me is when the end line surveys took place in each country. Did, it, did they all take place simultaneously in all countries in July 2022? Or were they implemented in staggered fashion a few weeks or months after the treatments ended in each country. Again, not that this really matters since the cross-country differences can be accounted for by country fixed effects. But in regressions where country fixed effects are not accounted for, the duration in say weeks between the end of the phone treatments and the assessment and the end line assessment could be added as a regressor to potentially measure retention or loss of learning over time. Slide 12, is it 12? So my, my next set of quibbles pertains to equation one on page 15. Does the dependent variable Y have to be indexed by, sorry, this is really, really quibbling. Does it have to be indexed by individual and household? After all, per household, only one student is involved in the study. So no need, I guess, to distinguish I and, I and J. Um, on footnotes 11 and 12 that explain equation one, is there a distinction between the baseline learning level variable that is a component of the XJ control vector, uh, XJ vector of control variables and the baseline learning level variable that is a component of the delta S or vector of strata variables? If they are not the same variables, how are they different? My third quibble concerns the dependent variable of the regression results reported in tables 1, 2, 4, 6, 7, and A4, for which no formula is given. But these are the measures of the learning outcomes. I, I'm guessing it to be a learning outcome z-score. That is, it is the difference between a student's score and the control mean and expressed in units of the control standard deviation. Yeah, maybe it would be nice to say the outright in the paper, right? My fourth quibble is on the estimation model of the results reported in table three on the spillover effects of program participation on the teacher's teaching practices and beliefs. The dependent variables are binary or binary variables or answers to yes or no survey questions, such as do you get your parents involved in your teaching practice? Do you target your instruction to your student's learning level? 
if you could go back in time and choose your career, would you still want to be a teacher? And does for the phone tutorial improve student learning outcomes? So my so we discussed this in a bit. So my, my training was it it's important to distinguish between probit load or linear probability models, but and, and maybe because I didn't know the literature, there should be some footnotes on, on those things, right? Um, about the recent developments. Okay, I raised the same question for table five, the dependent variables on specific proficiencies are again binary that indicate proficiency or not per student. If so, the treatment effects are estimated. Again, um, if so, well, anyway, the treatment, the, the coefficients of the treatments multiplied by 100 would indicate the increment in percentage points of the probability of being proficient because of the treatment. And that is why I find the notes of table of the table confusing. Slide 13, please. I think the notes should say that the coefficient estimate of T2 indicates a decrease in the percentage of students who are enumerate in column two and the percentages of students in columns three, four, five who are able to demonstrate a particular proficiency due to their being randomly assigned to T2. As written, the text can be interpreted as though the dependent variables are the shares of students who gained a particular proficiency or in the case of column two who have remained enumerate. So it actually took me some time to understand the sample size, why the sample size was so big. And yet you were, so I was, I thought that, that there, there was some back computations that were involved. So it was shares that were being measured, but, but they really indicate, but the notes really referred, I think, to the coefficient estimates. The same question also applies to table A5 on potential crowding out, as well as to columns three, four, five of table eight on parent and child beliefs. Uh, slide 14. My, my fifth quibble concerns uh, the interpretation of the caregiver regression results in table A5. On page 20, it is argued that, and here I quote from the text, by inducing caregivers to support one child's education, they invest less in other children in the household's education, close quote. I think that that last phrase is a typo. It should read, they invest less in the education of the other children in the household. But the next sentence then goes on to say, or to interpret the results as follows. And here I quote again, we find evidence of crowding in rather than crowding out over all time spent on education. But the dependent variables of columns one and two of table A5 are about whether the caregiver did education activities with the child herself, not other children in the household. So the results do not show that the caregiver spent more time on the other children in the household, on the education, uh, on the education activities of the other children in the household. Instead, what they show is that the treatments tend to have a complementary, not a substitution effect on the time the caregiver spends on the child's education activities. In other words, I think the appropriate concept is complement versus substitution of time. The, the caregiver, so complementary, the substitution, the caregiver's time as a, as a complement to the treatment rather than a, an, a concept about crowding in or crowding out. Um, finally, in, in, pay, in the second paragraph of page 19, figure A4 is a typo. It is figure A2 that shows the learning losses and gains in Uganda. So given the results reported, what are we to make of the research? Um, as an education administrator, as someone who has gone over to the dark side, I'm most excited about drawing the implications. The question I consider is to prepare in case there is another pandemic or climate change disruption that causes school closures for a sustained period, what should we do on the basis of this paper's findings? And the corollary questions are, one, can learning materials be developed in other 
subjects such as reading and writing, science and social science, history and geography that are that can be as effectively delivered using the treatment of a weekly SMS with a one-on-one 20-minute -on -one per week for tutoring. What would be the cost of developing such materials? In fact, how did youth impact do it in the case of this intervention? Um, I understand it's a one-time fixed cost of developing the material, but it could be a barrier to entry for some poor countries. Will the second, will the learning outcomes be similar with other subjects or will the effects prove subject that is math specific? Third, what happens if the intervention involves not just one subject, but the entire grade level curriculum over the entire school year as what should have happened during COVID? What will be the effect on learning of the increase in scope? So there could be scope economies or scope diseconomies when you combine subjects that have to be learned and multiple concepts and duration. So, so increase in scope as well as duration of the intervention. Will other variables like motivation, mental exhaustion, lack of interaction with other, other students become concerns? I wait with bated breath for Professor Angris's thoughts on these issues. Again, congratulations and thank you, Professor Angris, your paper, for your paper that covers so many dimensions of the education in emergency problem. Thank you, Sir Mike, with uh, your youthful thoroughness <laughs> in discussing uh, econometric results. Uh, kind of a flashback to our collaborations before. <laughs> so, Noam, would you like to give a quick rejoinder or uh, reaction to uh, some of the comments? Um, thank you so much. Well, one thing I would just start by saying, um, I don't know how many people here are writing papers and trying to get them read. I think you'll realize very few people read your papers. Um, I think the only people who read your papers are that reviewer uh, at the journal. So I'm just very grateful that you, uh, you read the paper top to bottom. Uh, I'm very um, humbled by that and I appreciate that. And if you haven't tried to get your paper read, I think over the years, you'll come to really appreciate it when someone actually reads your paper. So thank you, uh, Mike, for, for being so thorough. I think everything you said is, is resonates as correct, actually. So I'll make some of those tweets. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, the Yeah, and we already had some a discussion on, on some of these points, actually. Um, so just to mostly appreciate the careful read, um, there was one other thing I wanted to highlight. Oh, I also appreciated that you even proposed some figures, actually, for the timeline, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that was that was great. I think there was a Gantt card in Stata, which I didn't even know was possible. So I, le I learned something. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, yeah, so mostly appreciation, and I'll follow up on, on some of these points. Thank you. Thank you, Noam. <laughs> so uh, even before then, Sir Mike already had a reputation as a Stata guru and expert. So <laughs> he knows it in and out. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you, Sir Mike. Thank you, Noam. Uh, let's move on to our next uh, discussant, uh, Dr. Esther Albano Garcia. She is the uh, current president of the University of the East and UE Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center. He's a member of the steering committee of the South and Southeast Asia and Taiwan Universities Presidents Forum, and she served as commission uh, at the Commission on Higher Education as commissioner in 1994 to 1999, and actually as chairperson as well from 1999 to 2003. Uh, apart from that, uh, Dr. Albano Garcia is also a former administrator here at UP. Uh, her contributions in science and education, to name a few, include her efforts in initiating scholarship programs under CHED and uh, PCASTRD, proposing uh, for the establishment of the UP College of Science, conceptualizing the engineering and science education project funded by the World Bank, and developing the Philippine Federation of Chemistry Societies into an internationally recognized professional association. 
She obtained her BS in chemistry from UP as cum laude, her doctorate in chemistry from Ohio State University, and she also became a fellow at the ICN Nucleic Acid Research Institute uh, in California from 69 to 70, and an international research fellow at Syracuse uh, University as well. So please welcome Dr. Esther Albano Garcia. Now. Afternoon, everybody. As you may have heard from my uh, from my CV, it's obvious I do not know anything about economics. It's also obvious that I do not know anything about basic education. Uh, so I will not dare to do what Mike did. In fact, when I saw that he was the other discussant earlier, I said, "Thank God." But anyway, I thought that uh, instead of uh, uh, looking at the paper, I when I read it, and I, I did read it several times, I could barely understand it. Uh, I decided that uh, it's probably not a good idea to, to, to do that, to uh, criticize something which I could not understand. But I thought that maybe uh, what I could do uh, especially, I did. I thought that the audience would be mostly from deaf ed or or teachers of basic education. That that was my, you know, I, I thought that school of economics might have been just a venue <laughs> for an education uh, based uh, lecture. So I thought that instead of you know uh, criticizing something I don't understand. I thought I would share what we do in UE in terms of delivering online basic education. Uh, and the reason I thought this is because UE is probably one of the first that actually implemented online education in this country long before the pandemic uh, came. Uh, we started doing online education at the graduate school in 2011. And then in 2018, 2017 and 20, or 2018, can't remember anymore, uh, we started doing this for college and also for basic education. So we do have a long experience already implementing online education at the college level and also at the basic education level. Uh, people ask me why and who, why did I think about it? And I said, I don't know. I just thought that it was a good idea precisely for uh, what you were saying about emergencies. We do have many emergencies throughout the year, earthquakes, uh, typhoons, etc. And uh, as you know, I am in an easily flooded area in Recto. So, uh, and the students would like very much to have a vacation, but I don't. So I said, okay, whenever there is typhoon, you go online. Uh, in fact, I went online long before President Duterte declared that the classes would be, you know, no face-to-face -face classes and so on. We, we did that. Uh, I did that as early as um, early March of 2020, long before it was declared, uh, you know, a way to... Uh, deliver education uh, by the uh, national government. So I thought that was the reason why you invited me here. Okay, <laughs> you may have heard that that was the case. Anyway, so I will share our experience and I'm just read, basically read my paper. I send a copy to the secretariat and there are a few slides, but uh, those are just the simple slides. Paper, meaning uh, the paper that was presented today, explored the strategies employed in schools in five countries during emergencies in order to build a sustainable, resilient education system in response to the urgent call that education cannot wait. The paper has a profound discussion of these strategies backed with empirical data. Indeed, the scholarly endeavor is truly commendable, as already also explained by 
not just by the author, but also by uh, Dr. Alba. As I reflect on this paper, I tried to reconcile its observation with the actual situation in the Philippines, especially in public schools and small private schools that actually use cellular phones, radios, modules, and other affordable materials and media. These emergencies, especially the pandemic caused by COVID-19, are situations that triggered the Philippine schools to come up with the so-called learning continuity plan. In the University of the East, Basic Education Department, K-12, these are labeled as innovations that are structured, transferable, and sustainable. These are as follows. First, the adoption of the Central Visayas Institute Foundation's dynamic learning program long before the pandemic. Uh, well, I'll discuss it a little bit about this uh, later. University of, second, the University of the East Basic Education Flexible Learning Experience, or BFLEX, which is under the supervision of the Flexible UE Learning, or FUEL. And C, the third one, is using UE's online DLP, using the UE, UVE, and the, and the fourth is our multiple intelligence program in the basic education. The latter is a fusion of the academics and psychosocial activities to provide a support system for students to keep their academic, emotional, social balance, even under virtual settings and under difficult situations. Below is a brief discussion of these strategies. First, the Central Visayan Institute Foundation's dynamic learning program. Actually, this is a program of a couple, the Bernidos, um, uh, they are the owners, well, the, the wife is actually is the owner of the Central Visayas Institute Foundation. Uh, these are physicists from, uh, from here, Dr. Christopher Bernido and Dr. Maria Victoria Bernido. Our long-standing partnership with them produced 11 new ambassadors who were trained by the founders themselves to reach out to schools and promote independent learners all over the Philippines. What it is, uh, well, the program has four non-negotiable components such as parallel learning groups, activity-based learning activity sheets, or LAS, in-school comprehensive portfolio, and strategic rest, rest as in rest. The parallel learning component is designed to promote independent learning that students will do preliminary tasks without the teacher's prior lecture. The last, the learning activity sheets, makes the learning personalized and bite-sized. Only significant concept is included, an example, an activity or tasks. In addition, the in-school comprehensive portfolio becomes a mechanism to teach students the value of organization and ownership. Lastly, of course, rest. Strategic rest or rest period breaks the academic routine as it schedules the MAPE, yung, um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, PE, the equivalent of music and PE and so on, every Wednesday. So Monday, Tuesday, and then MAPE, and then uh, uh, the rest of the week, again, uh, uh, academic activities. The learning activity sheets induce independent learning and develop thinking and writing skills. This learning approach is being done virtually or face-to-face. -face. Actually, we started doing this together with the Bernidos a few years back. Uh, and in fact, as I said, we are now sort of a model. And that's why we have the Bernidos with the so-called 11 ambassadors. And we propagate this all over the country to interested basic uh, uh, education schools. The University of the East Basic Education Flexible Learning Experience, or BFLEX, which is under the supervision of the UAL, or uh, Flexible UE Learning. In UE Basic Education Manila, our learning process is very clear. We use the Dynamic Learning Program, or DLP, 
And the UEUVE, DLP is the one of the Bernidos. And the UEUVE, unlocking, unpacking, explaining, expanding, deepening, valuing, evaluating from grade five to senior high school. The learning activity plan is through the learning activity sheets of the DLP. For the lower grades, kinder to grade four, the learning process is still teacher assisted. Homeschool class, teacher assisted homeschool class, or TAS at HC, and the UEUVE. This had been implemented off site or online during the first two years of the pandemic. U is, is one of the schools, if not the first, that introduced online dynamic learning program. Below is an illustration of the UEB Flex. Could you, may I have the slide, please? First slide. I sent it to you earlier. I asked you what happened. Okay. Oh. Sorry about that. I can just read it to you, no problem. Uh, we have uh, multi-modal modal instructional delivery, B-Flex, face-to-face, school-based, online classes, flexible learning, meaning you can have both, hybrid classes, or blended learning, as the case may be. Uh, the options will depend on the IATF rules at the time. And we do have a virtual online classroom. Uh, we use Google, uh, Google Classroom uh, K to 10, and LMS Canvas for senior high school. And we use uh, quite a few uh, different online apps. So we use all of this. Uh, and of course, the learning plan delivery system, kinder to grade four, we have a learning activity plan. And grades five to six, we have the so-called learning activity sheets uh, of the so-called dynamic learning program of the Bernidos. Um, UE's online DLP using UEUBE. This is an adaptation of the CVIF DLP, meaning the Bernido program, using the online mode. So we already have an online mode, an online way of delivering the Bernido program uh, uh, we have it online. You can have it online. It has been structured using the UEUBE procedure. And again, we have a graphical illustration of our learning process, which illustrates the blending of the dynamic learning program of the Bernidos and the UEUVE approach. Uh, this was developed by our principal in basic education, Dr. Nieva Discipulo. Uh, for especially for UE basic education. Now this is where we will need. Medyo mahirap kung babasahin ko lang to. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, I thought I asked. Okay. Have it? Huh? Sorry about this. Uh, I did not send you a copy a week ago. And then again today, I, I know you have it because you gave me a copy. What's the document? Yes. It's, yeah, it's within. These slides are within the document. Sorry about that. Well, anyway. Uh, I'll see if we can understand this other, even if I just read it to you. For online dy dynamic learning program, they have their preliminary activities. And that is, they just uh, read 
copy and write and answer the learning activity sheets. Actually, in the Bernido system, they have these uh, learning activity sheets and you just have to read. Uh, we have to answer many of the questions even best before there is a lecture. Okay. And then there is a lecture. Uh, the Bernido system is one wherein uh, it is really designed for poor schools. For example, if a school uh, has a big enrollment and they only have one teacher in physics who is a major in physics, what they do is they divide the so many classes. In, I mean, they divide the students into several classes. And the one physics teacher would go from class to class. He would go to class A. And then a second teacher uh, for, that, let's say, an hour. The second teacher will come in in the second hour. And prior to this, the learning activities she had been given already to the students. So during the second hour, the second teacher, who is not an expert, just supervises, just uh, goes around and monitors uh, the students who are not copying from each other while the students are doing the activities. In the meantime, teacher A, who is the expert, goes to the other classroom and teaches the, uh, gives the lecture to the others and so on down the line. So they don't need so many physics majors to teach so many students. They only need one. Okay, so that's the what they call preliminary activity. Uh, and for online DLP, where uh, you have the uh, first, uh, you do what they call unlocking, meaning you review, motivate, and introduce, explore, and so on. You have pictures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Explaining, you uh, discuss. You process what they have uh, read and so on, analyze, and then expanding and deepening meaning. Uh, you now do practical things, collaborate, work with your sick mates, etc. Collaborate on activities. Ayan, Mariana. Okay. Uh, First, the uh, uh, preliminary activities and so on, unpacking, unpacking and explaining, etc., expanding and deepening. That's the first. And then, uh, unifying synthesis, summary, evaluating, or uh, whatever it is you're doing, and testing. Uh, here we get book and forms the questions and so on and so forth. And then, of course, the output which is your written work, etc. Okay. Uh, and every software, of course, hopefully, as soon as possible, you get the teacher's feedback. It was as an easy question. Okay, and then, uh, the transition from virtual classes, the progressive expansion of face-to-face -face was adapted. Okay. Um, uh, something like this. This one. Uh, uh, Actually, uh, when we already started the uh, meeting with the students, okay, 
we have rooms in UE that allows us to divide the students into groups, two, two groups, basically. One face-to-face -face on site and another group, half of it outside in their own homes. Well, it's obvious that what you need for that is that you, uh, the students should have their own devices. And thankfully, our students in basic education in UE have their own devices, phone, et cetera. So uh, we have a room where, which is, uh, we, we have rooms in UE which are so designed that uh, if I'm the teacher, I'm the teacher, and I have half of the class here, half of my class would be in their own homes. The room is so designed that uh, while I am here and we do with all of uh, with the half of the students here, the other half will see the whole uh, lecture, the lecture. I mean, including the teacher and all the students. And it's the same thing that the, the audience outside will see their classmates and their teacher and will can participate in the whole class. And you in this class in the in the on site can also see your other your classmates. That is how our many of our rooms are designed. So we can do half of the class. Then to make sure that they both experience both on a site and uh, face to face and online, every two weeks they change places. So the uh, group A will now go offline, I mean uh, online, and group B will stay face to face. And they do that every two weeks. But of course, uh, you need to design the classroom properly. Okay, that's what is being sort of explained there. Okay. That's how we that's how we did uh the uh remembered I well you don't remember because you're not in basic education. <laughs> uh there was a ruling in Chen and, and depend on this. Uh half of the class only will attend and so on and so forth. So we had to uh do this so that uh the whole class can participate and they all still see each other. Okay. Uh uh, this is a combination of three modalities, hybrid, high flex, face-to-face, -face, and online classes. The hybrid high flex is the holding of an uh, online class and face-to-face -face class by the same teacher at the same time. That's the one I was describing. The teacher interacts with the students of both online, off-site, and on-site face-to-face. So... The second uh, the possibility is online synchronous class is held virtually through LMS Canvas or Google Classroom. And of course, the face-to-face -face class. So we have the, all these different combinations for these different kinds of classes. And this we did during the difficult times of the pandemic. Okay. Uh, I think the next slide, uh, yeah, that's just a picture of what we had. Uh, a classroom, and then there's uh, the outside, the students uh, here. Uh, the students, uh, they, these are the ones who are at home, and this is the teacher, and I was telling you that teacher can see these students, and the students also can see the uh, teacher. Okay? Also design the way. Um, of course, uh, uh, well, of course, we all have the non-hybrid, uh, just the online class by itself, or the face-to-face -face class by itself. And we have the hybrid. Um, it, uh, well, we have in UE also uh, what we call the multiple intelligences program, interdisciplinary activity. So we have, uh, uh, it's an offshoot uh, of the, uh, multiple intelligence program in the UE Basic Education Department. Uh, it was introduced in 2005. Uh, there are, uh, as I, uh, as you already know, there are multiple intelligences. And this we tried to do also, whether online or face-to-face, -face, so that we have activities uh, uh, in all levels. We have clubs. 
we have formed clubs in the elementary, in the high school, and uh, 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 where they have, you know, like maybe geography and so on and so forth in the school. And then they have joint activities. And sometimes we have activities which are where, um, where all the different subjects would be involved in the programming uh, so that uh, uh, you can learn all kinds of things uh, while, while doing this uh, program. And, and that is, we've been doing this for a long time now, but as I said in 2005, but we had to uh, tweak it a little bit so that we can also do it uh, online. And uh, we've been quite successful that way. So um, I was, as, uh, just like uh, Michael, I did not ask uh, what the audience will be like. I thought it would be basic education people who would be here. And so I thought I would share the UE experience so that uh, you might you know, want to use it, part of it, and so on. But looks like you are an uh, economic student, so I don't know how you can use it. Anyway, uh, despite the COVID-19 and other events that caused schools to stop conducting classes on site, schools in the countries are, well, well in the study uh, uh, described in the paper, the schools in the five countries uh, came up with different strategies that enabled the students to learn in different ways and strategies. For most of these strategies is the use of phones. What I describe uh, is what we do in UE. Uh, we have devices also. We have, uh, we, are, we want to make, we make sure that the uh, students have devices. And thankfully, uh, even before I joined UE, we, UE was already sort of ahead of may, quite a few schools, ahead of many schools, in that it was preparing for, uh, well, it was preparing for the emergency, but it was prepared for the emergency when it came. We already had the facilities. Uh, we had some classrooms which are already designed for online education. So, so it was quite easy for us to start uh, online education when COVID-19 came. In fact, uh, in 20, 2018 is when I I uh, decided that uh, many of our classes would go online. And we've been doing that since then. But of course, uh, and when even before uh, President Duterte uh, ordered us to go online, we, we, I was a week, a week ahead <laughs> of the, the rest of, uh, uh, a week ahead of uh, President Duterte's order, we already were doing uh, this, uh, all, all, the, all levels of education from basic education to graduate school just because uh, we were prepared. And, uh, but the other thing I did, and I saw it in uh, Mike's uh, paper, is that, uh, uh, again, uh, I, I don't know why, but uh, in, before 2020 came, uh, it must have been 2019 or 2018, I asked that all the GE courses that we prepare uh, modules for all the general education subjects. That was also the time when Chen uh, uh, revised the, uh, G, G, the G curriculum. So I asked that all these be modules be prepared and that all these be, be placed in Canvas. So that was, and my, at that time, I was just thinking that just it's just to make things easier for the new teachers, especially. That was the objective. I, I wasn't preparing for an epidemic or whatever, but thankfully that also worked because we were ready with the, the G, at least the GE subjects. And when the pandemic came, I expanded that to all uh, many of the basic subjects that most freshmen and second sophomore students would take. Uh, so uh, that is also, we have placed this all on Canvas. Uh, so these are ready for, for the students to, to use and so on. So that when I went also to the medical, uh, as mentioned, I am also president of UERM. When I went to the medical school, we did the same thing for UERM. 
uh, we made them prepare modules for the uh, for the uh, for the medical courses, medical subjects, and they 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 also. So the way they do medicine now is that uh, they give this, uh, you know, uh, they uh, the professors prepare the modules, give them to the students ahead of time, and then just about all uh, they have face-to-face uh, -face classes for clinics and uh, uh, synchronous for some of the lectures and asynchronous for most of the classes. And asynchronous during, uh, and they, all they have to do is um, have basically uh, discussions with the professor if they have questions, especially on the materials that have already been sent to them. So that's how, how it's done, how we do it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. So, ayun, ang main takeaway ko is that UE is much more prepared than UP <laughs> for the pandemic. <laughs> Good. Ah, I see. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, last but not the least, we have uh, Rayton uh, Antonio Zulueta, Jr. Rayton is the president and founder of AHA Learning Center, a non-profit organization that has helped over 3 million students get access to equitable education trained over 180,000 parents and teachers through the DepEd, and produced hundreds of educational TV and radio shows. His organization directly services 2,000 students and parents through its community learning and leadership centers. Drayton is a multi-awarded teacher, community organizer, and broadcaster. For his work spanning almost two decades, Drayton was recently awarded by the Ahsoka Foundation, Obama Foundation, and the 10 Outstanding Young Men of the Philippines. Shaitan sits in leadership positions in many education organizations here and abroad. So please welcome uh, Shaitan Zulueta. Ten minutes. Aha, aha, po. Uh, hello, I'm Jayton Zalueta, and I can't believe that I have to follow such distinguished um, discussants, and I'm incredibly honored and pleased to be here uh, to talk about such fantastic work that you do in M Education. You know, the reason why I'm here, I think, is because I represent a lot of practitioners that are doing emergency interventions. Um, I represent teachers during the pandemic that were using Facebook messengers, almost um, 100,000 of them in 25 school divisions to display, uh, to talk to their students, to do lessons. Uh, we were doing radio, 13, 14 different interventions, uh, 13, 14 shows in DZRJ. Uh, right before us was Lorraine Badoy. Um, and then it was us. Uh, and it was, it was an experience, right? And what, what I first saw, when I first saw your slides, the first thing that struck me was how incredibly ineffective the materials, the interventions that we did were compared to M Education. And I accept that fully. It was uh, incredibly um, experimental, incredibly frustrating, and incredibly um, challenging time, the pandemic not only for all of us, but for the people that we're trying to reach as many students as possible. So today, I'd just like to frame my discussion in terms of introducing what the center does, um, some behavioral questions that I think are important. Three, I think there are the redefinition of emergency, four, the opportunities to focus, and five, the call for most of us who are inside the room. First of all, um, AHA Learning Center, the reason why it works, I think, or at least it should, <laughs> it looks like it works, like my board member says, it looks like it works until IPA would validate our results. Um, it's because of something we call an empathy-informed learning system. This started when I was 19 years old and I was volunteering in a public cemetery, teaching children how to read and how to count. At 19, I spent six years going back and forth as a volunteer, eventually putting up one small um, community learning center in Pililla, Makati. Uh, 
to putting up community learning and leadership centers with San Miguel Foundation, the largest of which we just opened last week. 39 classrooms, 2,500 people that we're expecting. Training, Zoom, face-to-face, in huts, in Mindanao, in Visayas, in places that wanted us, in places that did not want us. So when I represent, I'm a poor, represent, uh, a poor representative of the many teachers, the many learners. We just did a, uh, something similar with 9,000 learners um, in Zamboanga, Sibugay. And when people talk about it takes a village, um, siguro they forget the word coalition. It takes a coalition and partnerships to make it work. The reason why it works is because, and the reason why I think the most uh, impressive, impressive thing about us, or maybe the only impressive thing about us, is the fact that we are able to get a lot of people to do this for free. Our many teachers uh, who are incredibly busy, incredibly exhausted, go through a 40-hour training program and a 60-hour implementation, and they volunteer in droves for teaching at the right level. Our parents mobilize, uh, open their homes for interventions, and DepEd, God bless them if you are here, uh, volunteer. Sincere po yun, eh? may natatawa. <laughs> DepEd uh, acts as our mentor monitors in places like Bicol, Zamboanga, Sibugay, Zamboanga City. It works because we bring everyone together with what we call an empathy-informed learning system. The empathy-informed learning system recognizes that each learning intervention has a social-emotional learning problem and also a parent and teacher problem. It is not a holistic intervention. It is not a holistic intervention because we want it to be. It's a holistic intervention because after 18 years of doing this and mostly failing, it's what the problem requires. So uh, to give my comments, that is the lens which I am going through. Uh, not the data analytics or not the extremely um, being a president of a university, but someone who's in the trenches failing and learning. So I think the first problem that, that I think, or the opportunity that I think can arise is the fact that most interventions, and we have friends here from ABC Plus, USAID, uh, who are also doing fantastic work in Bicol. Um, most interventions do not really recognize the behavioral problems or challenges in implementation. Most interventions look at students as the numbers, which is fantastic. You are a school that is built on numbers. But in reality, if you come to think about a grade four student and how failure has affected that person, then an understanding of not only the way you present your intervention, but the extra support that is needed for a student who has for the last five years been attending class and doesn't understand anything. is incredibly important. You know, another behavioral problem that we, we were, we were uh, surfacing is the fact that many of the schools that we go to the teachers have difficulty recording monitor and evaluation reports. They have difficulty fulfilling these reports. So I was incredibly um, impressed to see how M education was a simple, usable, and um, I wouldn't say scalable, but uh, important tool that teachers can do right away. It's the understanding of the teacher's plight that goes beyond time management. In many of these forums, which I'm invited on, we just talk about the fact that they have not enough time. But very rarely do we come in and ask them, what exactly, what, how exactly are you spending that time? With deeper conversations, and we've held um, many, many forums, many of the teachers will discuss and talk about how, excuse me, 10 minutes, na ba? Bye -bye. Many of the, of the teachers that will come and discuss uh, about how they are actually spending a lot of time in the, with remediation already. On Sundays after school, they are trekking mountains, they are going through uh, boats to try to reach the learners that have been left behind. These are exactly the teachers that we have in our program. And I suspect the teachers that you should be targeting. 
that's why for my next point i would like to uh, implore uh, in my own little way that ipa youth impact will not be so obsessed with scaling when in this country in most interventions the goal is to scale as fast as possible and where has that gotten us many of the brilliant interventions have not been able to scale because they have not spent the time the talent or have made the connections necessary for teachers and parents and communities to trust that intervention. You, we always have to think that we are not the first intervention that, is, that has been done in that community. And more often than not, our challenge as implementers on the ground is to convince the school division and the schools to drop all other interventions and use ours first. And that requires time. If you are going to BARM tomorrow, focus on Sultan Kodarat, the lowest literacy and numeracy scores all over the country. Make good there, do well there, and allow us people who uh, do not have the academic wherewithal or the resources to come and visit your intervention and see it happen live. There is a need to focus not only in terms of M education, but in terms of our conversations about education in various forums like this. The need to focus, I guess, comes from our lack of focus, how we want every national problem to be solved in scale, as big and as bad as possible, but we do not need or want to spend the required time to sit with schools, and see the rehabilitation happen over years. It's important work, which the ecosystem clearly lacks. There are many brilliant people in the room that are doing policy work and research, but there are not an, enough implementers on the ground, which is why it's incredibly exciting that M Education has come here and given us a tool to be part of a solution. Now, you know, one of my um, time na ten minutes. Alam mo si Musa na dahoy, si Musa na dahoy. Oh, kasi hindi kasi ako pre. Kano naman kung medyo di ka masadong matalino. Kailang magising sa oras. Pero kung matalino matalino, kung brilliant ka talaga, okay lang mag over ten. I I just said I love STEM education. Yeah. Um. You know, one of my mentors, uh, who was a big champion of her work, uh, Undersecretary Mike Luce passed away last week. He spent a lot of time with us, walked me through um, the different parts and interventions that we had, gave us confidence and the strength. And I'd like to leave today with one thing he'd always ask, uh, tell us. Um, it is better to ask for... Forgiveness. Hey, wait, lang. let me get this right. Ask for forgiveness and not permission. Ask for forgiveness and not permission. M education is an incredibly um, experimental. It's an incredibly exciting program, but it requires trailblazers from this country to stay, to test, to work it out. We need to barge into these rooms that we're not invited in and say that, hey, we will not wait for EDCOM two, 10 years from now, the policy. Sorry, I was also invited there. Fantastic group. <laughs> but we cannot wait. The generations of children who are suffering from literacy and numeracy problems are currently, that problem is happening in real time. It's something that is uh, getting worse as the years go by. And while uh, some of us in the room are in the room to think of the next 10 years, M Education gives us the opportunity to think about tomorrow. I'd like, you, I'd like to leave with one last quote. I'm sorry for going over time. That's my quote. Um, in the center, in all the places, in community centers, in Zamboanga City, in Tondo, in Smoky Mountain, there's a quote that we always say, Tayong pagbabago ating hinihintay. 
tayong pagbabago ating hihintay. That means we are the change we've been waiting for. That means that if you see a problem, you not only try to understand the problem, but you make active measures to try to learn about solutions and take an active part in being part of the solution. It's something when I look at the room, around, when I look around the room, um, I can see some of your eyes thinking, is this me? Should it be me? Can I have the, um, do, am I smart enough? Am I good enough to be part of the solution? And I'd like to use me as a success story in the fact that a cemetery, someone that was in a cemetery teaching kids randomly with materials that we got off the internet presented in the Senate two or three months ago. Cementerio hanggang Senado. For somebody who um, everyone wouldn't fund for 10 or 13 years, we are currently running the biggest and largest community learning leadership centers in the country. And it's only going to get bigger and better because all of you can be part of it. All of you can be part of interventions like ours, can be part of interventions like M Education. Time pagbabago ating inihintay. Maraming salamat po. Thank you so much, Drayton, for those uh, incredibly nuanced insights. And I'm sure uh, no many team will uh, uh, find these incredibly useful. Okay, so uh, we have uh, a number of minutes uh, and we can accommodate a number of questions. So if I may invite Noam, uh, Sir Mike, uh, Ma'am Esther, and uh, Drayton to please sit, please sit uh, in front uh, as we collect these questions from both our uh, in-person and uh, as, uh, online participants. Yes, uh, any, uh, choose any. <laughs> Okay, so um, if you have questions, so please raise your hand and Ray Ray, my former student, will be uh, collecting your questions at the back. And for those online, uh, we also have time to collect your questions as well. So uh, please uh, send your questions through a private message to user Oopsie Seminar in the Zoom chat box. So any questions from the floor? Let's start with the uh, audience here in this room. Sigel. Ayan. Please introduce yourself and uh, yeah. Hello, good afternoon. I am Aleli Kraft. I'm a professor here at the school. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation. Very interesting. Um, um, I haven't read the paper, so I'm basing my question on your presentation and also on Mike's. But I was just wondering maybe for scaling, pros scaling. okay, um, you did a random uh, allocation of the treatment across students, but would you have the average number of students per teacher? Because then uh, the 20 minute call every week, uh, if you have like how many students that the particular teacher could call, that would probably require more time and could decrease the effectiveness. So um, like, for instance, if you did a random allocation, of, uh, I would I would think that, you know, from a school, you just pick students randomly and then the teacher assigned would be like their class moderator or class advisor. And so the likelihood of having, a, you know, um, a teacher call one student, you know, 20 minutes a week, that's particularly fine. But if you're thinking about the whole class, like what um, um, the last <laughs> discussion said, yeah, um, then it would might really take so much time and the um, attention of the teacher might, um, you know, might decrease. So, um, so that's uh, some, I, I'm not sure whether that has been controlled for in the paper or in the regression, but I think for scaling, pro for scaling purposes, it could have an impact. Thank you. Uh, who would like to take that question? Sure, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. And I'll also um, piggyback off of that to uh, come back on a, a point Jason made on scale. Um, I would say the ratio is very important. It's one of the key things that we were thinking about and are still thinking about. Um, it really depends how much time the teacher or tutor has. 
So if it's, a, you know, during the pandemic, the teachers had a bit more time because they were supposed to be doing this virtually. So in theory, if a teacher is doing this full time, it looks like a reasonable ratio can be one to 20 or one to 25. If the teacher is working full time, then they can't do that. Uh, and then it's closer to one to four or something like that. So, th so that's true. Um, so I think in terms of scaling models, one has to think about it. So is this going to be an approach that maybe is a summer camp or a holiday camp? Then the teachers have the time. You know, we, we've been in discussions with Debat about these summer camps actually and, and thinking about integration with that. Uh, but yeah, that's the learning camp, exactly. Um, is this an approach that could be during the disruption, right? During the typhoon, for example. Um, or is this an approach that should be targeted to the struggling learners during normal time? Actually, maybe it's not everyone. It's the ones who need it most. Another conversation that's been happening is DEPED has been recommending discussing uh, partnerships with LGUs and SDOs to hire more teachers through the Special Education Fund or kind of para teachers to do this in a dedicated fashion. Uh, so we, there, there's some, that's a, that's a key, I agree, a key feature of how to scale. Uh, and we need to figure out what the right model is in each setting. So thank you for, for that great question. Um, to, to Dayton's point, though, I also wanted to say, I agree. I think scaling without impact is is not great, right? I think sometimes we scale because it sounds nice, 42,000 schools, but are the kids learning? If they're not learning, what was the point? And so, you know, I think that happens quite a bit. I won't, I was going to give an example, but I won't give an example. Uh, but I think there's lots of efforts like that. And I think I think that's right. I think it needs to be taken. Sorry, there's a bit of feedback. I think it needs to be taken in stages. Um, I do think it's still exciting to grow and, and build towards scale, but I don't think we should run before we walk. And I think it should really be an interaction between scale and impact. Uh, and that can mean maybe the most marginalized. You have the highest impact. But I think growing that and figuring out what that intersection is, is the right way to go. Just an example on that which is not specific to a particular approach or program, but some other data. Um, I recently looked at uh, policies that governments uh, announced during COVID, uh, and we systematically analyzed policies across over 100 countries. And governments announced really ambitious policies, uh, distance education and radio and TV. We then triangulated that with household survey data. What did households actually receive? And in many cases, it was less than 10% of households that received anything. And that's not even looking at whether they learned. That's not even looking at whether it worked. So I think that's exactly right, that sometimes we have these big, fancy policy announcements uh, that don't really translate into practice. And I think that is that implementation process, which you, I think, called us to action for, needs to get a lot more attention. Uh, I think sometimes we focus too much on the policy and not enough on the practice. So I thought I just wanted to come back on that and appreciate that point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Noam. Uh, any more questions? Yes, from the back. Name, please, and uh, who? Hi. You would uh, my name is Arby. I'm a licensed teacher. I'm actually wondering why this is being held here at the School of Economics instead of the College of Education. Um, maybe it's all about financing. Anyway. Um, so I was listening to your lecture and I was wondering if um, maybe you're familiar with the history of education in this country. In 1925, we had a Monroe survey. That Monroe survey said, so that was after the Philippine American war. That Monroe survey said that English should be the instruction, should be the mode of instruction. 25 years after in the UNESCO survey said there is a language problem in the Philippine education system. 40 years after 1991, EDCOM report, the Educational Commission, Edgardo Angara, familiar name here, said there is no improvement since the Monroe report. Now we have the EDCOM 2. They're doing it right now. And now we have the Matatag curriculum recently launched. A 45 page shaping paper full of descriptives and nothing but justifications on why the DepEd has failed. 
you are suggesting moving to a mobile uh, mode of education. Will this be any different from the fact of what happened in 1925, moving from Spanish to English, now from face-to-face -to, -face to mobile? Would it be not the same 25 years after perhaps an EDCOM report again saying that moving or shifting to mobile was wrong? That's my first question. Second question, in the same manner that I hate mathematical economics, I also hate mathematical education because, you know, in numbers, garbage in, garbage out. All right. I was listening to uh, 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 Dr. I'm sorry, I didn't get your Alba. Name. Alba. And he was very thorough in his mathematics. And he was very thorough in making sure that the inputs are correct. I was wondering if you were measuring in your mathematics there. You were doing fractions, and then you were also measuring, um, uh, what's that, uh, uh, estimation. Those are two different mathematical abstractions, two different mathematical concepts. And you're measuring it from face-to-face -to, -face to mobile, all right? Um, how sure that your data are so representative of what's really going on that we should really shift to mobile. It's not safe uh, Let's uh, have the reactions from now first. Okay. Thank you. Wait, so, so one actually, um, I think I don't know the Philippines context that well. Luckily, we have a great team that, that do. Um, so maybe someone can come in here. But um, so I, I, I can't comment on the specifics that you referred to, but I will say that it is true that around the world, learning has not improved for decades, maybe century, actually. So I think that's, that's, I, that is very clear in the data in most countries, actually. And it's, it's sad. I think that's why people are calling it a learning crisis, because it's a crisis. Kids are not learning. What's kind of interesting is governments around the world have been fairly successful at getting children into school, but not actually getting the children learning. So I think it is a crisis, and I think many things have not worked, actually. So I think we do need a bit of a wake-up call. Um, one thing to just clarify, so this is a specific intervention and it worked, but we're not suggesting that this is the way of the future. We don't think we should disband schools and everyone should instruct over the phone. This is one approach to add to, you know, many approaches, right? The kind of work that AHA is doing, that other people are doing, you know, there's many, many approaches. We need all of them. Even if we get all of them right, you know, I'm crossing fingers, it might help, but it will be hard. So this is one other thing to consider. It's not the solution. And the other thing I would say is when we think about evidence, and I actually think this is something really important for people who, who do research, I think it's also important to separate out the intervention from the principle. And so in my view, when we look at a research study, what we learn is about principles. We don't actually learn, in my opinion, about um, carbon copy kind of activities. And so, for example, teaching at the right level, which is another very evidence-based approach, looks different in different countries, looks different in different regions. Uh, and I think what one wants to think about is the principle of targeting instruction, and then you operationalize that in the local context. So I don't think you want to carbon copy interventions across settings, actually. So I just wanted to clarify, um, to clarify that. Uh, yes, I think I've... And then on the numeracy point, I don't know if I, I fully... Um, grasp, but I'm happy to come back on that. Yeah. Any more reactors from the panel? Sir Mike? <laughs> <laughs> so just to set the context for no, the, the Monroe Board of Education report was actually done in 1925 um, to assess the, I guess, learning outcomes in the Philippines. And, and uh, what was found out was, was that language of instruction was a problem because in um, in in math students could actually were actually numerate in the sense that they could do operations 
But uh, when it came to word problems, they did not quite get. So they did not. So the the learning on numerical on operating with numbers did not translate into problem solving. And the and the idea was it was because they did not understand the yeah the medium of instruction. The second finding was even in science education, the problem was that they were using um, textbooks from the U.S. because we were then a commonwealth of the U.S. And uh, the context was very deep. So the textbooks would talk about mulberry trees and there aren't any in the Philippines. <laughs> so, so, so the lack of context, I guess, contributed to the poor learning outcomes. So it's been a debate for a long time on what to do with the language of instruction. The problem though, so, so the problem, I mean, the, the pushback is that if we were really serious about doing first language, there are probably 200, 300 languages in the Philippines. So how do you create learning materials that that are that many and, th and, and so so it's so even so you know uh mike Luce was in my in my board also in the fe public policy center I, he was in the board of fe roosevelt so we we interact i mean and dj de jesus is also in our in our board and the back and forth between us is the language of instruction because dj wants dj's point is, is the reason why we're scoring so poorly in PISA and TIMS is a language issue. On the other hand, um, do we really have, do we really all want to shift to Filipino? Is that is that the way to go? Because we cannot certainly adapt. I mean, what language, we still will have to answer the question, what language of instruction will we use? Even the variety and the dialects within each language, I don't know how, how that is practicable. So anyway, let me just put it out there. Then you should also not conflate delivery and uh, so, so language of instruction problems are different from the, the intervention problems. I mean, that he was talking about. So, so, so you cannot conflate, you know, the, the, Two problems together to be one and the same. I mean, that's, that's the point that I would like to make. Okay, thank you, sir, Mike, for that nuanced uh, insight. Uh, we have time for just one more question because Noam is uh, on a very tight schedule. <laughs> they're, they're, you're meeting at uh, Edcom, I think, uh, later tonight. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah. Um, <laughs> it will reach Edcom. <laughs> so, one more question from the floor or from the online audience, if there's any. Well, is there any from the Zoom participants? No. Yes, one last. Yes, I'm afraid just one last from you. Hi, Noam, thanks so much for the great presentation. I work with RTI, my name's Mitch. Um, I think you presented before early on on the Botswana results. And I had the same question during that presentation that Mike had as well, which is how does this translate uh, this technology, the content, the learning uh, tools, how they might translate to other subjects, uh, especially reading, especially literacy. And the language issue is one that's really confounding. Um, I'm formerly with ABC Plus, but I work with uh, another USA project now, and we're always tackling that. Um, also, a question on scale. And I guess this is not as much a question as, as an opportunity because the twelve dollars is, while it seems cheap, it's not affordable for per person, um, and especially if it's uh, not for families, probably not for LGUs. But how do you integrate that into the current structures where individuals are already doing the work, and now they just, as Jayton said, using the tools to do the work that they need to do already? And how might you engage with PPPs to be able to bring down the cost? So. When you're presenting this to EdCom2, DepEd, and others, think about what the cost drivers are and how to minimize those cost drivers. Um, 
and, it's, and even to USAID, because um, we would be interested in looking at ways to explore potential collaboration for further study. Hold on, I, I have these a couple, just a couple more points. And of course, my phone won't open. Um, the two other things that I'm interested to hear, maybe not now if we don't have time, but how is this technology adapted for children with disabilities? Um, learning disabilities is a particularly uh, thorny issue. It's we're trying to reach tier three children. Um, and, you know, how does that technology adapt to meet their needs potentially? And you mentioned potentially going to last mile schools, but last mile schools are notorious because they have no connectivity. So is there an offline capability for this? That's it. Thank you. Can I maybe answer one of the questions? So, so, so I was just uh, talking to Noam to say I wanted to connect him to Migo. Migo is a platform that apparently, so I, this was just told to me uh, secondhand, but one of the investors, so one of the investors in the Philippines uh, reached out to me to talk to me about Migo. This was invented by, apparently by the person who invented um, Kindle Inc. in the Kindle Reader. His point is, we need, is that he wants, he now wants to use his wealth to, to uh, address the, the invisible part of, uh, of a, how do you, an iceberg. And he says, Bigo is, is that, no? The, his idea is there are many island schools uh, in the Philippines or ma many schools in remote areas that don't have cell signals. So his, his intervention is to use Sari Sari store hubs as, as hubs for distributing information. The, the idea is, so the business model apparently is, and now I'm not sure whether I should share this publicly because, but, but anyway, the, the, the idea is if you subscribe to Migo, you can go to a Sari Sari store hub, download as much content as you want, including K, uh, Korean novella, uh, telenovelas, whatever else, but unlimited, unlimited stuff that you can download. Uh, on your device, and that will include uh, inform, uh, education content. And that's the hope for teachers to adopt in these remote places. Uh, the second part of it will be that they will also need to distribute workbooks uh, to students so that, so that teachers and students can interact from the with the teacher content, the downloaded content, and the workbooks. But so that's that was uh, the discussion. And Noam should talk to the Migo guys. I think. Yes, please, please do make that introduction. Thank you. Um, yeah, so on cost. So actually, the cost that we included is the fully loaded cost. So actually, to, to the point that you're making, if you, the biggest cost driver is always people time, so teacher time. Um, in this case. So actually, if you, this includes extra, if you included the extra stipend cost, if you actually did it in fully in the system uh, and you just re-shifted teacher time, then the marginal cost is very low, almost zero, actually. It's just kind of load or air time, you know, depending on, on what it's called. So it's actually very, very, it's even cheaper, actually, than that number. So I think that's a, a great point. As long as you can think about and build in a, a scaling model where teachers are able to reallocate their time. It's also been great to learn about ABC Plus. Actually, we've been hearing a lot about it, learning about it from RTI and, and USAID. We just met the mission director this morning uh, and the team there. So it's great. And again, I think, you know, the more approaches, the better integrating them and seeing how they complement each other. Um, so it would be great to talk more about that. Uh, one thing just to mention um, that we did the approach in six languages, right? Six, yeah, six languages. So we did actually try to customize it and match teacher to student based on language. Actually, that was part of the design. Uh, we haven't yet done other subjects. I think literacy is going to be harder uh, for a variety of reasons because it benefits from visual aids, but we're trying now. We're actually testing literacy at the moment in Botswana and in Afghanistan. Um, so we'll keep you posted on those results. But also to, to say that 
I, to the point I was mentioning earlier, we don't see this as a solution for everything. Uh, I don't think you can teach algebra through the phone. You know, that's going to be a bit tricky. So this is foundational skills, you know, foundational skills, probably mostly numeracy, maybe a little bit of literacy. Uh, and it's it's just one such approach. Um, and it is, it's possible to be offline. So this is not smartphones, no internet. I think if there's no cell signal, that's a problem. We don't have a solution for that, but it doesn't require internet. Um, yeah, so those are a few responses. Okay. Um, yes, Jitan. Um, no. The um, the gentleman from RTI. Uh, I think it's very important to understand what the last mile schools are. Multi grade. We interventions, even the most. Um, basic services are unable to really thrive in places like that. Um, I think the context in terms of having areas that have completely no signal uh, are more rampant than we think. Um, you know, I, people go to the top of the mountain, scale around mountains. Um, the work that they do is so impressive because they're able to still get people around um, who are of that context, but I think similar to our learnings from microfinance uh, institutions that have scaled, you might want to look at the particular economic profile that might not be the poorest of the poor, um, and in areas that might be a little more, what's the word, urban, I suppose. Because even in places like Tondo, which is like 15 minutes away from a super mall, mall of Asia, we have completely no signal. So we've tried like three or four interventions that come in. Um, a lot of our numbers actually uh, are just big numbers. Um, a lot of the interventions have failed in scale because of of these issues. So I think um, it's 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 important to to focus on that segment. Should try Starlink. I'm Starlink. <laughs> Elon Musk Starlink. Okay, uh, maybe one very quick question, please, from the back before we end. Good afternoon. Sorry, I came late. Uh, Niwan ko muna po yung trabaho ko sa PNU ITL. Uh, Professor Lorena Castro po, I'm teaching TLE for almost 30 years. Ang dinatang ko po nagsasalita kanita is si Professor Garcia. At yung last to sa Taga San Miguel. Yes. Uh -huh. At yung may question si AAC, madam. Uh, being a teacher for 30 years, because the topic is about building resilient education system. And I'm teaching uh, more of skills, right? So ang masasabi ko lang, tatagalugin ko, later I will uh, speak in English kasi ang mga HE teachers daw ay mga mahina sa English, no? <laughs> but I'll try my best. Uh, being a teacher for 30 years, Ang gusto ko lang maingkinta sa isip niyo, ang mga teachers kahit nasaan, whether it's mobile, hybrid, flexible, um, by all means, hindi kami kailangan matapos o mamatay nang wala kami na ituturo sa mga estudyante. Palagi ko pong yung sinasabi sa mga estudyante ko bago kayo lumabas ang klase, kailangan nakakasiguro kung kayo ay natuto. Okay? So that is my principle as a teacher. So whether in, in, in any place, in any place, I will be assigned uh, because I also have an experience dealing with uh, less fortunate uh, students in AMB, A Million Voices Foundation. I teach them for free as, a, as an extension service. Um, I may say whether in any place I can teach, uh, as long as those students, adult parents that I teach, uh, can bring whatever skills I taught them and be a source of their income. Maybe that's good enough for me to say that at least I have done or impacted their lives. In lang po, ate. So, mobile or what, in any place, basta ang teacher ang prinsipyo, palagi kailangang matutong estudyante. That's all for today. Thank you so much. Kasi kasayin po akong ano, OIC director sa school. Kaya, 
Four o'clock na po ako halos na kami sa school. Okay lang po. Wala pong problema. <laughs> Sige po. So, uh, what a way to end uh, from the perspective of a uh, long-time teacher. So, uh, importante mapakinggan ng boses nila. Sige. So, uh, we, on that note, uh, let's end this afternoon's event. Please join me in thanking again, Noam, Sir Mike, uh, Ma'am Esther, and Jayton. What a wonderful conversation. So, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, actually, we will have refreshments at the ba- outside, I think. Uh, so, uh, feel free to... Uh, stay and uh, have those refreshments so uh, just a reminder so uh, if you have so please scan the QR code uh, shown on the screen uh, will be shown on the screen uh, so that you can uh, answer the exit survey uh, we need your feedback uh, very important and uh, we also invite you to join future events of UPSE as well as the Philippine Center for Economic Development so thank you everyone and have a pleasant afternoon Hello. So yung ating refreshments will be in the uh, adjacent room, room 111. So please make sure to find the right room. <laughs> Sige, thank you.